Hello and welcome to GCB Analytics uh, webinar. Today we're going to be talking about the uh, finance hey, I share services yeah. sector. Hi, Jaidev. Uh, um, I am very delighted to have along with me today uh, Jaidev uh, Shogil, uh, head of uh, Capital One uh, Growth Ventures. Um, Jaidev uh, has been uh, head of uh, head of uh, Capital One Growth Ventures for several years now. Previously, um, he was a, he was an entrepreneur, and his company Bundle.com got acquired by Capital One. Formerly, he's also served at CD Ventures, Deloitte, and uh, Credit Suisse. Uh, um, in terms of his academic background, he um, he holds an MBA from INSAD, as well as a bachelor's degree in engineering from uh, Northwestern University. So, uh, Jaidev, um, uh, a real pleasure and honor to have you uh, here with us on this uh, on this webinar. Sorry for the for the quick start, as as we were a few minutes late. <laughs> Happy to be here. Mm. All righty. Um, so before we before we get into the uh, intricacies of, of the fintech and financial services sector, I'm going to give now the word to our um, uh, founder and editor in chief, uh, Jim Mawson, for a few uh, introductory remarks. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Kalyan, for setting up the introduction, running the data and the analysis from the GCV analytics platform. And Jaidev, let me please extend my thanks and gratitude for your joining. It's really wonderful for us to have such a sort of guest speaker and a superstar in the fintech area, both as an entrepreneur, which is what I think most people are aspiring to be, but also a serial corporate venture leader. And, uh, you know, I think your sort of ranking on the GCV power list has really reflected what you've done for the industry more broadly, as well as the, obviously, in the New York fintech ecosystem. So thanks once again for joining. So a little bit about sort of us, uh, obviously this webinar we're doing, we do one a month, we look at a different economic sector, but Global Corporate Venturing as a trade paper is trying to really answer two questions. Who does corporate venturing in terms of which corporations and what do they do? What deals are they investing in directly as well as indirectly as a limited partner in venture capital funds? And how does that join up with the rest of their open innovation or innovation tool sets such as R&D, M&A and sort of incubators and accelerators? And so Global Corporate Venturing, as well as doing these types of analytics webinars, has the academy to provide the training, and that's all bundled together under the Leadership Society, so people can get the news, information, uh, events, training, and sort of general help and support to the ecosystems. One of the publications we do, as well as Global University Venturing and Global Impact Venturing, and it's, we pull together most of the ecosystem through, next slide, the events that we're doing. So we have, as well as our Houston event next week, uh, we've got uh, our main California event coming up at the end of January with about 800 plus corporate venture and leaders. It's about $10 trillion of aggregate annual revenue from the corporate. So attend about 200 billion of venture assets under management, as well as coming up next June, June 3rd to 4th, we'll have our sort of 10th annual GCV symposium in London. So looking forward to welcoming more people to the ecosystem there, as well as obviously our Israel, Brazil and Asia Congress events that we're doing. And so in terms of understanding a little bit more about what we're doing, as well as the sort of energy and summit events, if we go to the next slide, um, we do do a number of sort of programs around the database to help people understand the ecosystem and we're delighted to partner with uh, Silicon Valley based Cubix Analytics to help understand and develop out the, the analytics tool set. So I won't say uh, too much more at this point, I'll hand it back to Kanye Ann who will run through the analysis that we've be, just been doing for the, uh, for the sector view on financial services and then obviously we'll sort of have Jaidev add his specialist knowledge and insights as well. So, Kalyan, back to you and uh, take it away. Thanks, Jim. Um, so, before before I, uh, I get into the uh, sector analysis, uh, I would just like to remind the people of watching this webinar live that they could submit their questions on the uh, panel, the control panel that should appear somewhere on the right hand side of their of their screen under the questions section. And uh, towards the end of the webinar, uh, Jim, um, Jaidev, and I will uh, will try to address all the all the questions uh, you you guys might have. Um, now let's uh, let's get into uh, the sector properly speaking. 
um, when we talk about a sector, it, it behooves to start with a, with, a, with a definition. So the way we define the financial services sector um, for the purposes of our report uh, in GCV is it, it encompasses uh, payment tech and cryptocurrency, um, uh, personal finance and wealth management, insurance and insure tech, alternative lending and crowdfunding, client and risk analytics, things like social investing and other fintech related uh, related enterprises. So a fairly a fairly we take a fairly broad definition uh, as uh, as you can see. Um, and when we talk about uh, general trends in a in a sector we define so broadly, we we must keep in mind that. Uh, banks, insurance companies, uh, payment uh, companies, or asset management uh, companies uh, have been have been going through a digital transformation, and they have uh, started to become more customer focused, more customer centered in the past uh, in the past half a decade or in the past decade, and uh, this has uh, been largely because of the involving the, the involving uh, an emerging fintech ecosystem. And um, in the banking industry in particular, the banking industry has faced certain, has faced and continues to face to, a, to an extent certain profitability challenges, uh, mostly due to uh, stricter regulation that uh, was put in place after the Great Recession. Um, although some of the, some of the current, uh, current prospects uh, seem to be optimistic, at least for US and Asia-based banks, uh, more so than for European banks. Um, and, you know, faced with these technological challenges, customer centricity challenges and so on, banking institutions and other financial institutions increasingly adopt new emerging technologies like AI, big data, blockchain, etc. And here I'd like to engage Jidef and ask, to what extent um, is it true that uh, nowadays uh, fintech newcomers are increasingly viewed as a more of a, as an opportunity than than as a threat? <coughs> uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, it is interesting if you were to think about the different categories of uh, of fintech players. Uh, there are certain areas uh, absolutely where they could be viewed as as threats for example <clears throat> in the payment space where you see some companies getting a lot of traction like stripe and in other places you know depending on the kinds of companies it could be viewed as an opportunity and these are specifically in areas where the company might be open uh, to work with banks uh, in a more uh, partnership model where in a way they uh, you know start thinking about uh, the bank partner as a B2B opportunity versus a direct to consumer opportunity. Uh, so I'd say you know the, the there's more sophistication in the thinking these days uh, as to whether you know their partnership opportunities or if it's uh, purely competitive in nature. I see. I see. Uh, but uh, in either case, I suppose uh, it makes them equally interesting from a corporate venturing standpoint uh, as, a, as an opportunity to invest in earlier, even if they're perceived as threats and uh, to sort of have uh, a bit of an optionality there, uh, slightly longer. Uh, absolutely. Time, right? Absolutely. I mean, listen, yeah. you know, I think the partnership models are evolving. Um, and, you know, what one might view as uh, competitive uh, at one point in time could indeed become uh, a partnership and more cooperative uh, as the uh, company's uh, uh, kind of products evolve as well. So, uh, you know, from a venturing perspective, uh, one tends to look at kind of the whole gamut, uh, whether it could be viewed as a competitor or a, a, a partnership opportunity at that point. I see. All right. Um, and another another space in which we've seen uh, much disruption, uh, as I've uh, pointed out in the bullet points here, is the uh, payment space, um, in, in which uh, because of because of the emergence of mobile payments and the gradual disappearance of cash, you might say, we do see a bit of a, a bit of a commoditization going on, um, which uh, 
is expected to make it harder for uh, players in this space uh, to drive volume-based uh, feed growth, which might force them to look for differentiation in things like B2B payments, cross-border payments, and uh, ancillary services. So uh, what are your observations on the uh, payment tech space and uh, most recent developments uh, in Agile? <clears throat> Listen, I think it's it's one of those spaces which scales in a very different manner compared to you know depository products or even lending products, and that's why mm -hmm. we've seen uh, companies that are able to go out there with, you know, in the grand scheme of things, relatively little capital uh, and actually start showing up as you know uh, as uh, you know a, a you know several percentage owners of the total payment landscape. Um, you don't hmm. see that on the uh, on the depository side as much, and on the lending side as much. But you know, B two B payments is is uh, I'd say still kind of ripe for the taking. You know, we haven't seen kind of like one or two solutions come out there and make a massive kind of dent in that area. In large part because surprisingly, the the uh, uh, mode of payments is still very analog in that space. But I think there's massive, uh, you know, green field to be had over there. Cross-border payments mm -hmm. is you know, an area that has continued to evolve. There's a lot of action happening over there, and the incumbent solutions just weren't serving the customer need well. And you can see how, you know, many companies have have come up in the cross-border space that are actually taking up a good percentage of that market. I see. Very interesting. And um, in terms of uh, other other general trends, uh, when we talk about um, financial services, uh, we cannot uh, skip talking about uh, an area called wealth management. Uh, so that area seems to have uh, have remained a profitable business uh, in recent years due to a confluence of uh, very uh, very good factors like uh, positive microeconomic trends, uh, good stock market performance, uh, some um, shift towards uh, fee-based um, versus transaction-based relationships, uh, favorable demographic shifts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that still seems to be uh, seems to be a very profitable business. Now we we are yet to see if, if this is uh, going to continue to be the case. If uh, if we are headed for for another recession uh, next year, as uh, some people are, are afraid that we might be. Um, and in terms of alternative lending, which is another very, uh, very interesting and hot space in uh, Jida, you already touched on that. Uh, but, uh, you know, when I was doing uh, the research on this report, it, it turns out that, uh, that there is a huge, there seems to be on a global level, a huge gap between the financing needs of small and medium enterprises and institutional-based uh, financing that's available to them. And uh, there's this estimate of uh, around $5 trillion that uh, that I cite here on the slide. And um, I just wanted to wanted to ask you, what is your your feeling? Is this, uh, is, is this, is this sort of emerging uh, space going to cover underserved segments of the market uh, or is it, is, is it moving uh, as a threat to tr even traditional banks in, in a low interest rate environment such as uh, we still live in today? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think, you know, lending to SMBs has uh, has always been a little bit tricky given the attrition rate with uh, SMB businesses in general um, and the lack of kind of uh, pure data in that space that allows for kind of really good underwriting uh, Right. Uh, especially when you look at other categories in the SMB space. You know, that being said, I think a lot of smaller SMBs are being kind of looked at more as kind of individuals. And, uh, you know, there are some interesting companies out there now that are looking at, you know, pulling in different data points for those businesses for enhanced underwriting uh, to be able to get them, you know, larger kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, lending amounts. Uh, and or kind of moving into the you know uh, the funding more as a working capital uh, relationship where uh, the SMBs actually value that money for you know 90 days, 120 days. So you know I think mm -hmm. that this is a space that's that's going to continue to grow. Uh, you know the uh, the capital markets can be very fickle in this space as well. 
as, as it is with most lending. So if there is a downturn, I think people are going to be looking at uh, collections uh, methodologies and effectiveness very carefully in this space to ensure that you know the companies that are lending a lot of money do have robust uh, you know collection capabilities, and that's going to be extremely important during any uh, perceived uh, downturn. And it's not only you know the collections, but it, it it becomes about managing outstanding credit. It becomes about you know managing. Uh, or predicting which sectors might uh, actually start uh, hurting earlier than others. The fault, yeah. Yeah. managing the book in cases. Mm, right, right. Uh, the, the, there's a whole there's a whole set of challenges as, as this uh, this uh, this very interesting space has emerged, uh, sort of like in the years post the Great Recession. Um, so they have uh, they have not uh, had really this sort of uh, this sort of baptism. Uh, in the business, so to speak. Um, now, in terms of the other points that I've outlined here, um, now I I do I do note that uh, that there is a there is a relationship between big banks and uh, big tech, which is somewhat tense, although it's not entirely antagonistic, at least at least not uh, not in Europe and in the United States. Uh, at this point. Um, however, the reason why it might be antagonistic is because we already have good examples from East Asia, uh, where a big tech company or a big e-commerce company goes into the, say, payment uh, payment space, uh, such as you know Alipay from Alibaba, and uh, takes a considerable share of that market. So. Uh, that, that relationship is definitely something to look at. Um, in terms of the insurance space, um, it, it has also been undergoing significant transformation with uh, the emerging uh, insure tech, which uh, not only um, rationalizes um, processes that might be expensive uh, and uh, long and drawn out, but it also gives more control to uh, to consumers. So that's that's a very important general trend there in that space to note. And uh, my final point here on this slide uh, is about cybersecurity, which um, uh, is still and probably is just bound to be to continue to be uh, a big challenge for uh, for any financial service uh, firm that's getting digitalized today. Um, and I'd like to ask you, Jai, uh, what are in in your observation, what are some of the cybersecurity challenges that innovative uh, startups might be able to help with? Uh, because I, I do know one of the main areas of uh, Capital One Growth Ventures is actually uh, authentic, uh, authentication and uh, and cybersecurity. So uh, I would appreciate your your comment and insights on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, listen. I think cyber is an extremely important area uh, for us, and I, I'm sure it is for you know any bank out there. Uh, you know, the data assets that we protect for customers is, you know, the ultimate form of trust over here. And uh, the the cyber landscape is just evolving so fast that, you know, one has to almost have a strategy of figuring out, uh, you know, what's coming next and incorporate that into your stack before it even arrives. Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time looking at uh, uh, perimeter security. We've spent a lot of time looking at workforce authentication, customer authentication, and also within the wall kind of data protection, you know, and data access and governance. And so, you know, at, at the crux of it comes, you got to think about where, where the threats could be. And sometimes it's malicious and sometimes it's just, you know, mistakes that happen. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the thing that one really has to push for is how can one use technology to try and detect those mistakes, uh, you know, either kind of before they might happen or as soon as they happen so that one can get to fast remediation. <clears throat> and so there are many parties mm -hmm. uh, that are potentially at, uh, at risk, right? Customers, uh, when accessing uh, you know, the Capital One website, uh, could have uh, malicious attacks and uh, their credentials could be stolen. So we could watch for that pretty carefully. Mm -hmm. you know, our employees sometimes might uh, you know, make mistakes in the way they, they code, et cetera, uh, leaving certain vulnerabilities open. And of course, malicious attacks all the time from uh, from people outside the organization, which are all kind of realistic. And so I'd say, you know, 
right. uh, thinking through cyber across all those different dimensions and solutions across all of those is uh, is extremely important for us. Right. Um, and now let's move on to the um, corporate uh, corporate investing space, uh, corporate venturing space. Um, on a, on a global on a global view, uh, we did track over twelve hundred deals backed by financial corporates between October last year and end of September this year, and uh, a good number of them, uh, four hundred ninety six actually in uh, U.S. based companies. Um, so so I I know uh, Capital One is primarily based in in the U.S. as a as a banking institution, but uh, how active is Capital One Growth Ventures internationally? Uh, in what regions? Or geographies do you look for for new and exciting uh, innovation? Sorry, could you uh, could you just repeat that? For some reason, you cut off. Oh, uh, sorry. So, uh, in uh, how active uh, is Capital One Growth Ventures internationally? Do you uh, invest um, anywhere outside the U.S.? Yep, got it. So uh, we invest in companies that eventually could be helpful to Capital One. Uh, most of our business is North American based. Uh, and so what we're finding actually is that, you know, there are companies that are, you know, Europe based uh, and or Asia based that are actually looking to enter the US as a market. Um, and so, for example, uh -huh. we invested in Riskified which is a Tel Aviv based company uh, that does fraud risk management for uh, for online merchants uh, that now uh, have entered uh, the US in a pretty big manner. Uh, we we invested mm -hmm. in Pizai, which is a Portuguese company actually that uh, uh, also entered the US. They've got businesses in Europe, of course, but uh, are, are also entering the US uh, or have entered the US and are doing quite well over here. It's another fraud company and we're looking at a uh, at a uh, uh, London-based uh, security company as well that is bringing the solution to the U.S. It's it's pretty uh, amazing how you know the 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 footprint of revenues for these companies are just expanding uh, given that they are digital businesses you know and and given that North America is a pretty large market you know we expect that that most of the companies would want to at some point have uh, have a business here in the US so yes we 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 kind of look globally right right um and um when speaking of looking globally if we look at how uh, financial service corporates have uh, have invested. Uh, so if we break it down by sectors, we do, we do see uh, we do see certain interesting patterns. So many of the commitments, 336, uh, did go to emerging uh, fintech enterprises, mostly payment tech, uh, some cryptocurrency, insure tech, and alternative lending. So no big surprise there. But we've also seen uh, investments in other in other tech. Uh, in synergy with with the financial services sector, so 225 deals in uh, in IT, mostly cybersecurity, AI, and uh, big data analytics. So uh, probably not much surprise there. Um, but also some uh, also other things that may not be um, at, at first sight particularly uh, may not seem particularly related, so, such as life sciences. Things like pharmaceuticals, medical devices, uh, or other professional uh, professional services like accommodation, travel, logistics, and supply chain. Um, so, so I, I think uh, that what this slide really illustrates is is how broad uh, sometimes the investment uh, theses and the investment mandates of uh, of financial service corporates might be. Um, and indeed, if we look at uh, some of the uh, co-investments of financial sector ventures, we we see quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of variety on this network diagram here, uh, which shows um, so, so so what it what it shows is is a, is a wide range of uh, solutions from AI solutions for big data like digital reasoning or Oxdata um, or uh, H2O.AI as they were named afterwards uh, through transaction analytics solutions like uh, Access FinTech. Of course, we have payment tech uh, companies like Veeam, Payd, Blade, 
insure tech like wealth or next insurance, um, some alternative lending like better mortgage, uh, some cybersecurity uh, like Menlo, um, Menlo and Menlo security and uh, and even mobility and ride hailing companies like uh, Grab and Gojek here. Um, now. Jaidev, I, I believe you guys had, in, even though it's not on this slide, uh, but uh, I believe you also invested in Oxdata or H2O.ai, if I'm not mistaken, is that correct? Yeah, we were early investors in, uh, in H2O, and uh, I think there are a few places where we intersect with uh, some of the other banks uh, and co-invest with them. It is interesting to see how the space has evolved. I remember you know, 10 years ago, there was, you know, so much paranoia when one bank used to invest with another bank in a company. Uh, mm -hmm. And now I think that whole, uh, you know, thought process has matured quite a bit and people are realizing it's not just about co-investing, but much more about how well are you able to actually execute uh, with that startup and ensure that you're getting the most out of that uh, that technology. I see. And what is your, in general, because you did mention the co-investing issue, in general, what has your experience been co-investing with uh, with some of your corporate peers? Maybe not necessarily always from the same uh, sector, but um, just other other corporate uh, VCs. What's your experience been with that? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think, you know, the, the corporate VC space has come a long way. And, you know, the contemporary kind of corporate VC uh, brings a lot of value to the table. So we are we are happy to see other corporate VCs, uh, you know, co-invest with us. We think that, you know, some of them can bring some pretty uh, incredible uh, commercial opportunities to the table. And we know that, you know, when, when corporate VCs kind of invest that, uh, you know, the company is going to get a very good shot at getting a commercial deal with that company. Uh, and navigating uh, that commercial deal uh, is always much easier when you have a uh, corporate VC uh, co-invested because they are going to help you get to the right people across the organization. So, so we like it. Right. And uh, from a pure just execution perspective, you know, we, we've rarely come across a corporate VC that isn't able to kind of move fast and get the right amount of diligence done and uh, close uh, close the deal smoothly. All right. Well, that's uh, that's definitely that's definitely promising. Uh, sounds definitely promising, and uh, and, uh, and and really really hopeful uh, given the professionalization that uh, the CDC industry has uh, has been going through over the past uh, over the past years. Um, now let's move on with the presentation. Uh, no, um, in in terms of in terms of the evolution uh, on an annual basis of uh, investments uh, from the uh, financial corporates uh, we did see that it uh, that it went up um, it went up in uh, in 2018 in, in numbers significantly from 796 deals the previous year to over over a thousand deals that we uh, reported last year uh, but even more more impressively, um, the amount of total capital in those rounds, not just corporate capital, total of uh, capital from the entire syndicate, did go up uh, almost almost doubled uh, from uh, 41 billion to uh, 76.5 billion. So and that was that was something impressive, uh, which uh, may not be matched this year if we if we consider um, if we consider that uh, by the end of uh, by the end of September we have we attract uh, about 39 uh, billion worth of deals. Although the number of deals is still is still fairly high, it's still over 900 deals, uh, and it may may well uh, well have. Uh, we may well see the same level as last year, or uh, probably even slightly more. Um, but th these data here really suggest that uh, there might have been a bit of a a bit of a cooling down on the on some sort of bullishness in terms of valuations. So I really wanted to ask you, like, as an investor, do you? Do you see uh, other investors becoming less bullish, or valuations uh, becoming slight, slightly going down, or kind of cooling down? Um, 
and respectively, if that's the case, what is your take on a potential economic uh, slowdown and uh, what are the sort of opportunities investors might, uh, might have, uh, have to take advantage of <laughs> there? Yeah, you know, what's interesting is um, we haven't really seen a cooling of multiples for the right kinds of companies. And so, if, you know, what I'm trying to say here is that you know, if there were 10 companies, maybe in the past, you know, all 10 companies might get a relatively high valuation. Uh, uh -huh. But today, people are kind of homing in on the two or three that could be the winners in that space and, you know, pouring more money into those companies uh, at, uh, you know, pretty consistent uh, multiples as uh, was, uh, you know, compared, compared to last year and the year before that. So, you know, I think for for the right kind of companies, we haven't seen a major cooling in uh, in uh, uh, in multiples and valuation. You know, I, right. I think one of the kind of bigger picture items that one needs to kind of address and think about is we're going through a phase where there's just a massive rewriting of technology stacks taking place at companies, and so mm -hmm. that's you know, that coupled with just a complete change of expectations for customers on how they interact with with companies is leading to tremendous opportunities for you know a set of new startups to become the incumbents um, and i think that in part that thinking is driving some of the valuations and it's less uh, you know susceptible to kind of short-term swings in uh, economic uh, cycles uh, you know, and, and whether, you know, you, you have GDP go up, down, plus, minus, one, two percent, I think uh, a lot of investors are taking the long view over here that uh, coming out of all of that, there's still going to be those two or three companies in any given space. And those companies are more likely to be the, the, the winners and the new incumbents. And so, therefore, you know, paying up and ensuring that one gets uh, those companies appropriately funded is, is pretty critical. I see. I see. Uh, well, that's uh, that also sounds uh, sounds reassuring. Um, uh, if we do look at the top investors over the past year, um, here on the next slide that I've included, we see kind of a kind of a list of uh, ones that you would call kind of usual suspects. You see Goldman Sachs, SBI, Wells Fargo, other names like Fidelity um, uh, and Financial. And, and 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 others and um, just just to be fair to you, Jadev, as as our guest uh, here today, uh, how many deals have you guys done at uh, Capital One Growth Ventures over the past uh, over the past twelve months? So, is there like a particular number of deals that you target to do within a year, or is it more on like a, as you decide as you go basis? Yeah, we you know we we don't target uh, any deal flow numbers uh, or capital numbers, you know, we want to invest the right amount given what we see. Uh, so this year we'll probably end up doing about, we'll invest in about uh, 10 companies. Okay. Uh, how many of them are new and how many of them are follow-ons just, uh, just uh, All the tentatively? Ten follow -on. All right. All right. I see. Um, and if we look at the uh, top corporate investors in uh, in fintech uh, fintech startups, so uh, we see corporate investors from both financial sector and from other sectors. So we see again uh, Goldman Sachs, SBI, but we also see some uh, big tech uh, names like Tencent. Uh, we see uh, uh, SoftBank uh, and, uh, and 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 other names that we could. We could see here on the list. I'm not, I'm not going to go into uh, into too much uh, detail, really. Um, but if we look at the evolution uh, of corporate funded, corporate backed fintech enterprises, we do see on this graph that it's uh, it's almost an exponential curve. You could draw from 20, uh, 2011 onwards till uh, till last year, and largely to an extent to uh, including this year as well uh, and the number of uh, number of deals has, has grown like more than tenfold 
um, in a way from 37 back in 2011 that we were tracking to uh, 404. Um, this, this is all, of course, disclosed deal flow and uh, the one that uh, you guys as investors don't disclose, obviously, it doesn't, doesn't get on the pages of our magazine, so it doesn't, it doesn't get shown on the graph. Um, so, uh, you know, always uh, take, you know, these figures as a pinch of salt and as a good uh, sample approximation in a way. Um, and you know, if we if you look at the subsectors, uh, the subsectors that have been uh, the hottest, uh, obviously we see that payments. This is in the pink. Uh, is the one that uh, that has taken taken off quite a bit. Uh, also, uh, things like insurtech uh, and uh, and alternative lending. And uh, you know, when it comes to payments, uh, I, I just wonder, Jaya, do you think? Uh, the, the this development in, in payment tech uh, has been um, has been due to some sort of a special catalyst uh, other than you know the emergence of the smartphone do you think perhaps uh, blockchain uh, has played a, a significant role in it yeah i mean listen i think part of it is um you know there's there's a good uh ecosystem of infrastructure that's been developed over the last few years uh, coupled with adequate supply and demand on both sides of the famous uh, on the payment side that's led to you know uh, enough companies coming up in this space you know one, one of the things that that we're looking at a lot and and this is somewhat payments related as well uh, but it's, it's the whole kind of like banking as a service um uh push where you know the the host of companies that are providing uh infrastructure to allow both startups and now also other larger organizations to build new functionality pretty fast you know um mm -hmm. and you know what what in turn that does is that it allows some of the existing payment companies that might be consumer facing to also uh, you know, pivot their models somewhat to allow for additional business to come through, you know, third party originated payments. And you know, you see what, what TransferWise is doing with uh, with a couple of larger players in that space like Zero, or even, you know, uh, use a different example than than payments, you know, on the underwriting front with Zest and Discover. I think there's this big movement where you know that the banking as a service capabilities are leading to you know, the capture of additional revenue streams, thereby making mm -hmm. payment business much more uh, much more attractive from a from a TAM capture perspective. I see. That's uh, some great some great insights right there. Um, now, if uh, I'm going to use my uh, my second spider diagram for for the next point here, um, and you know it it really emphasizes what what I said that it's basically payment check, alternative lending, and insure check that have been the hardest uh, the hardest sort of uh, subsectors of fintech. Uh, in a sense, and uh, you know, corporate co-investments in, in in fintech enterprises, as as shown, we we see, well, we see a lot of payment tech like Go Cardless, Viva Republica, Devito, um, Paystack, uh, Akilaku, um, also alternative lendings uh, companies like C2FO, Lufax, Cubetal, uh, Zest Money, even Financial insure tech companies like Lemonade and Akinova, um, and even cryptocurrency trading solutions like um, like uh, Coinhouse, for example. Um, so, so we do see you know, quite a bit of quite a bit of variety uh, here. And uh, and if we look at the uh, top deals by financial corporates, I'm not going to go into detail into each deal, but I just wanted to mention the you know you know the really top three top three deals that stood above the 1 billion mark. Uh, we had the uh, much local services subsidiary of uh, Alibaba, Elimi, Kubey, raise uh, 4 billion, uh, 4 billion dollar round of the 30 billion valuation from investors, including uh, SoftBank and Alibaba's uh, own 
financial services affiliate and financial. Um, then China-based online service provider, uh, online financial service provider, Lufax received uh, 1.3, uh, 1.33 billion dollar in a round co-led by SBI Holdings. Tencent committed uh, 800 million dollars uh, to lead a Series D round for uh, China-based real estate uh, brokerage uh, KE. Uh, ke.com and uh, you know on the rest of the deals um, our our readers could uh, could find uh, and find more information on our, on our website or you know or in our latest uh, latest issues so I'm not gonna go too much into it um, but I'd like to ask Jaidev uh, is there perhaps a recent deal that you've done that you're really excited about or that you would like to uh, talk about or uh, share with us yeah, I mean, listen, it's uh, it's it's not completely recent, but you know, uh, one that we feel very proud about is our investment in a company called Snowflake, uh, a data warehousing company, where mm -hmm. you know we were able to kind of really uh, work with the company to figure out how we should deploy the solution, and came up with a pretty innovative way to deploy the solution so that it worked within Capital One. And we've stayed pretty close to the company, and you know, uh, you know, we, we've seen it kind of really flourish uh, in the midst of really competing with some large players, some large tech companies in the space. And you know, as a result, the valuations have have gone up uh, very nicely over the course of uh, of the last uh, of the last kind of couple of years. And so, you know, it doesn't appear on this chart, uh, but you know the numbers are now getting to the point where they are raising some significant uh, uh, dollar amounts, and uh, you know they continue to get a lot of commercial traction. But it, it stands out in our mind because we were able to come in early enough and really work with the company to uh, to uh, fine tune their products so that it worked well with us, which I'm sure in tune uh, in turn then helped uh, them sell to other other corporates as well. Yeah, uh, wonderful. That's a great, great success uh, success story. Thanks for uh, sharing it with our audience here. Um, now I'm conscious. I'm slightly conscious of, of time that we've uh, we've advanced a little bit. So I'm going to go over the next few sections uh, slightly more quickly so that we could have a Q and A at the end because I see there are some uh, questions coming uh, coming in from uh, from the people watching this live. Um, very briefly, in terms of the in terms of the exits, uh, we do try to um, track exits that involved uh, that involve corporate uh, corporate ventures, uh, either as exiting investors or sometimes as acquirers. And uh, in the um, in the financial sector, we did see 97 uh, such exits uh, over the past 12 months. Uh, good number of them, 70 actually, from U.S.-based companies uh, and uh, Within those, so uh, we did have 52, 52 acquisitions, 44 IPOs, and uh, one other transaction. Um, in terms of the year-on-year uh, -year evolution, we did see exits uh, shoot up uh, quite a bit uh, last year. By the end of 2018, not only in numbers up from 62 uh, the previous year, but uh, more impressively. Uh, the uh, total estimated exit capital uh, went up from 15 billion the previous year to uh, nearly 60 billion, so that's almost four times. Um, and uh, that again uh, would be kind of hard to match this year uh, when we're tracking so far uh, slightly less than uh, 27 billion. Uh, although in terms of the number of deals being done and being tracked, uh, it's uh, it's pretty much already already the same the same the same number of exits. Um, now, very very briefly, Jida, have you uh, had any any exits uh, yet, or um, maybe a possible one uh, coming up soon? Yeah, we've had about four or five exits on the portfolio. You know, most recently, uh, Verdon. Uh, uh, was acquired from a portfolio security company acquired by uh, by FireEye. Uh, you know, we had Silence that was acquired in the portfolio. Uh, you know, so uh, the, the, those exits are actually starting to take place, and it's uh, it's good to see. Right, right. Um, great, great time to ripe uh, the fruits of uh, your investment labor, in a sense. 
Um, in terms of the funding initiatives uh, that we've tracked uh, pertaining to fintech, we did see some drop. Uh, some uh, significant, uh, some significant drop, both in the number of initiatives, as it's shown here, from 62 back in 2017 down to 40, and it seems like this drop is going down, and the same is valid also in the taller dollar amounts uh, that we tracked. Um, in terms of the uh, top initiatives, uh, well, I'll just uh, briefly mention, briefly mention the top uh, three of them: a U.S.-based uh, blockchain. Uh, Financial service provider Algo Capital closed a 200 million venture fund with uh, several corporates as limited partners, including uh, data marketplace Whipson and consulting firm Roker, uh, Japan based uh, financial services firm Mitsubishi uh, UFJ uh, Financial Group launched a 180 million uh, fund to focus on uh, fintech startups in Southeast Asia and American Family Ventures, which is the uh, uh, corporate venturing unit of uh, the eponymous uh, insurance firm, uh, did uh, raise its uh, its fund uh, for more 160. It, it closed. It did a first close for a fund uh, for 162 uh, million dollars. Um, I'm not going to dwell on, on, on the rest of them, even though they are very interesting, but um, I, I, I want to briefly touch on um, university venturing and uh, fintech innovation coming out of academia. According to our data and what we've been seeing and, uh, and publishing, um, deal flow coming from academia, from university spinouts in, in fintech has been rather sporadic and kind of weak in uh, at least over the past year. Or so, so I wanted to ask you, Jai, real quick. Do you look for uh, innovation coming out of uh, coming out of academia in any way? Yeah, we have uh, you know relationships with several schools now, uh, mm -hmm. and work with the equivalents of you know the labs. We think is a pretty interesting uh, area, and I think university is also getting much more commercially minded, where it's you know, not just R&D anymore, but rather things uh, that can take that R&D and transform it into a, a commercially viable product. So we think that it uh, it could be a good source. We haven't done anything directly from academia yet, but, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, companies that uh, we're starting to look at. Yeah, no, that's, that's great to know that you're starting to look at that space and uh, there's promising stuff coming out of there. Um, and one more last question um, before before we um, before um, I, I give the word to Jim and uh, also to uh, questions from the audience is I, I, I do know you guys are doing this uh, startup uh, barometer uh, survey. Uh, would you would you be kind enough to share with us uh, what it's about, how it's done and uh, how do you use the data from it? Yeah, I mean, listen, we haven't we haven't done a more recent one, and uh, you know, I think we're due to do one. But the point of the barometer was simply to go out there, you know, once a year, twice a year, and talk to, you know, as many startups as we can to get a sense as to what, you know, how are they feeling about different things, right? Whether it's kind of like how are they feeling about interacting and selling to corporates? Is that better? Is that worse? You know, how are they feeling about fundraising? How are they feeling mm -hmm. about the be looking forward and so you know we thought that you know a barometer like that just hasn't been done yet in the marketplace but it could be a pretty interesting way to gauge the uh, the overall mindset of uh, of entrepreneurs and investors uh, there, there's some more done on the investor side but not on the entrepreneur side and so we thought it'd be a good way to uh, to at least start tracking that and seeing how uh, it evolves year over year yeah, um, it, it, it sounds like a, sounds like a great initiative. Uh, last year we did uh, we did try to do a bit of a, a bit of a pilot survey. It was a fairly fairly short sort of uh, sort of survey with a somewhat limited sample of uh, entrepreneurs who had already received uh, corporate backing, and we did get some uh, some interesting results. So it might be a good idea for for us to partner up uh, on this oh, potentially. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, now, um, over to you, Jim. Um, Perfect. Well, thank you, Kalyan, and thank you, obviously, again for the great insights, uh, Jaidev. One of the things that we were super interested 
when you gave the keynote at the GCV Synergize event we did back in September in New York was this understanding of the organization, how you work with portfolio companies and sort of almost create a sort of a, a dashboard of, uh, of your relationships with them. And we've got a neat a question coming in from Nino Kamenhanti um, about the organization structure that you have in place at Capital One to generate the most strategic value i.e. establish commercial agreements, knowledge share and that sort of thing. Can you just run through a little bit about perhaps that sort of dashboard that you use, how you think about working with portfolio companies and getting that strategic value and how that changes over time? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's interesting. When, when we started uh, doing uh, our business, uh, you know, we, we were kind of of the mindset that, uh, you know, our involvement kind of ended at the introduction to capital to uh, different people at Capital One. And, uh, you know, we would occasionally check on the business and make sure that things are going fine. You know, what, what we subsequently discovered is that you actually have to have a pretty defined organizational structure to act on those uh, value capture points. And so we built out uh, a team that we call venture development that works with the internal stakeholders at Capital One uh, to really understand the needs. And then when we actually invest in a company, uh, their sole uh, kind of job at that stage is to ensure that the company gets commercial traction. And the places where it's most successful, we found that there has been somewhat of a pre-sale of that investment to the eventual stakeholders so they know what's coming down the pike. Uh, we've been able to influence the company's product uh, direction so that it works well within the Capital One environment. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just working down to developing the actual commercial uh, uh, solution. We actually have a small tech team as well as part of uh, our, uh, our solution that helps with the POCs, but then also helps with what we call solution transfers uh, into the line of business production systems. Super, thank you, Jodif. And another and question- And there's one more about. question, yeah. yeah. Do you want me to read it out, Jim? No, uh, it's okay. A question from Professor Mounting Martin Hemmick. Um, I noticed that the largest uh, Swiss banks and insurance firms will engage with startups and do a few POCs. However, they rarely, ever end up uh, doing joint projects or investing significantly. They tend to build it themselves. Um, I tend to build it themselves. Uh, furthermore, uh, they are not really strong at integrating startup projects uh, into their own IT infrastructure and uh, IT network platforms. Uh, so uh, Professor, uh, Professor Hemmick's question is, is this typically Swiss banking mentality or do you see this elsewhere globally uh, to the same extent? Hello? Jaidev, can you hear us? Jaidev, can you hear us? Oh. Sorry, I was uh, I was muted here. Um, you know, I, I think uh, one of the things that you see with the build it yourself, uh, th there's some advantages to that, right? In that you can build exactly what you need and you can build it in a way that, uh, you know, is completely tailor suited to to what you want. Uh, the question we've been asking more and more is how important or how proprietary is that thing that you're building yourself, right? And in most cases, we find that an off-the-shelf solution actually works better because not only do we have, uh, you know, the ability to, uh, to uh, 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 you know, uh, use it right away and not have that lag in terms of, uh, you know, building it ourselves, but also the maintenance of those uh, technologies are done much better by the external company because they're actually, that's their business, you know. Uh, you know, in terms of the investing part, you know, th there'll obviously be a lot of companies that we would POC and that, you know, we won't end up uh, working with or investing in. And so I think that's just the nature of the beast. You know, every year we speak with about six or 700 companies. We'll kind of go deep with about 20 or 30 of them. And then we'll actually end up investing in about eight and working with about four. So I think part of the equation over here is just developing that muscle so that we can get to the right endpoint, and those four or five companies that you eventually work with 
are extremely valuable for us. Um, so you know, I, I'd say that's kind of where uh, that's where the, uh, the 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 crux of the issue lies. Yeah, I think just to add on to that, Jaila, there was quite an interesting survey done by Sapphire, which was funded by SAP, the German software provider, and um, they looked at the sort of chief investment officers, basically those controlling the IT budget, and they asked how many of them were increasingly using startups to help inform, and it's something around 80% were using it for things like cybersecurity, that external you know, input, and they were increasingly using them as part of their you know, vendor sort of platform. And it was partly for that reason, you know, rather than getting your own spaghetti junction of, uh, you know, sort of internal proprietary software and adding on various bits and pieces, if you use a sort of modular framework, then, then you know, you can potentially, you know, make it easier to drop things in and out and make things easier to sort of, you know, create specific projects and work on things that can work without, you know, sort of, you know, unraveling the whole, the whole architecture. So, uh, it feels like that's where a number of banks are, are going, and not just banks, but more broadly, you know, across the different sort of uh, companies. Is that that seems fair enough? Absolutely, yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, so thank you for me. Uh, I don't think there are any more questions on the, on the floor, and I'm mindful we're sort of just at the top of the hour, so uh, we don't want to run on too much. So I'll pass it back to Kanyan for the final words. But thank you, Kanyan, for preparing all the data and running it through so expertly. And Jaidev, you know, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure and an honour to hear such wonderful insights. So thank you for that. And I'll let Kanyan do the final final few few remarks. Sure. Um, uh, just big thank you uh, to Jaidev uh, once again for. Um, making it today and uh, for being part of this uh, webinar. A uh, great pleasure uh, to have him uh, share with us uh, his insights. Um, and uh, this is going to be actually uh, the last webinar for this year. So stay tuned for our next uh, next webinar, which will take place sometime in January. And we will be talking about the uh, transport and mobility sector then. Uh, we don't have a fixed date yet, but uh, stay tuned for it. Um, and um, th thanks very much uh, once again to uh, Jaidev and, uh, and Jim and uh, to everyone attending this webinar live. Um, have a good uh, day uh, or afternoon or evening, wherever you might be in the world. Goodbye. <laughs>